Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And I do hope you're exceedingly well. And I'm sending you loads and loads of love. And I hope you're going to get that lovely hot cup of cocoa or that coffee or tea, whatever it is that you drink, because I've got a lovely story for you tonight. But before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, My name is Martina and I'm from Denver in Colorado, which is situated on the high plains of the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. My ancestors emigrated to Denver from Mexico in the 1900s along the routes of the old railway lines and we have lived here ever since and never looked back. My family still upholds many of our traditions and embraces our ancient culture, along with our long-drawn-out love affair with the chilli pepper that brings to life some of our famous traditional dishes, from chilli con carne to tacos, salsas, wraps, and so many other dishes with names you may find difficult to pronounce, if you're not Mexican, so I'll save you the bother. My strange incredulous story that ultimately led to my anomalous Bigfoot encounter happened in 2015, when I was 18 years old at the time. It all began when my mother and I rented out a small apartment in Snowmass Village during the winter months, which is about 15 minutes commute to Aspen. For the both of us, this was a quintessential opportunity to raise more money for our ever-increasing family, as now both my two older cousins were expecting babies in the spring. We had been recruited for a cleaning job which involved housekeeping and straightening up some luxury cabins hired by wealthy, affluent people. These are regular, opulent, prosperous visitors who tend to frequent Aspen during the winter months to embrace the fabulous arresting and indelible skiing opportunities and, of course, other exhilarating experiences Aspen has to offer, of which there are many, including fabulous fine dining, high-end shopping at some of the most exquisite boutiques you've ever seen, or driving to Independence Pass, or even visiting a ghost town. Believe me, there is so much to do in this part of the world, which is steeped in a vibrant, rich cultural history, and is blessed with an idyllic setting and a perfect climate. It's difficult to leave Aspen without being touched magically in some way by the place, as it is a very profound, memorable way of rubbing off on you, as it is such a spectacularly awesome place. Aspen is nestled in the heart of the Rocky Mountains at 8,000 feet, so you'll find snow in Aspen half the year round. Hence the reason that you'll also find four ski resorts there. Words fail me to describe to you how breathtakingly beautiful it is in this part of the world, and the winters are dramatic, wondrous and awe-inspiring, and the views of the majestic maroon bells, the most photographed peaks in North America, are utterly stupendous. I was born and raised in Denver and grew up here with the rest of my extended family in what I can only describe as a modest, very bog-standard looking home. But it served our most immediate needs, and it still does, although space was in scant supply and our tiny yard leaves much to be desired. But we're fortunate enough to live next to green parks, hiking trails and vast open spaces, so I can't really complain about all of that. I live under the confines of one roof with my aunt's family, along with her four children, and my parents, along with six of my rather rambunctious, noisy younger sisters and brothers. So as you can imagine, it's a tight squeeze for all of us, but a very jovial, happy household nevertheless, which I wouldn't change for the world. Growing up as a young girl in Denver, life was never easy for me, and for many long years my life was incongruously cloaked with a dark veil of desperate unhappiness, which was exceedingly strange, because I had nothing to be sad about, as love was never in short supply in our household. Yet I felt this ineffable deep-rooted sadness that was so distressing and soul-destroying for me that I would seek relief from my tortured state by cutting myself. I know it sounds incredibly crazy and incongruous to the uninitiated, but it would seem that when I cut myself with a sharp blade and watched the bright crimson red blood gushing out of my wound, I would feel this incredible sense of relief. It was like I could breathe again. It all made me feel alive inside my heart that always seemed to feel so dead, lifeless and empty, almost as if my life was devoid of any purpose or meaning. Before long, I had so many scars on my arms and legs from all my cutting. I was deeply ashamed of this deep, dark, insidious secret that I kept well hidden from my family under emotional lock and key. A skeleton in my cupboard that I hoped 
would never ever be uncovered. That was until one fateful day when I forgot to lock the bathroom door behind me. That was when my mother walked in on me, catching me in the act of cutting myself, and she nearly did her nut. I've never seen her so distraught or dismayed in all my life. The expression on her face, I will never forget. She was mortified. I remember her grabbing my blade from me and screaming, What on earth are you doing to yourself, girl? My mother immediately sent me to a top psychologist and worked double shifts to pay for my extremely expensive medical bills. And that was when I ultimately received all the psychological help, guidance and evaluations that I actually needed that changed my life dramatically, so much for the better. I was to learn that the root cause of my inscrutable distress and enigmatic grief was due to the very fact that I was part of an identical twin. A year after our births, my twin sister Emma died of SIDS at one years of age. Both my parents kept this fact a classified secret from me. They falsely assumed it was best that I was never informed about her, as it could potentially cause me anguish and heartbreak. Growing up, I'd sensed that something intrinsically wrong and ambiguous was missing from my life, which was why I was so unhinged and deeply troubled. Once I discovered that I was part of a twin, it explained away the hollow vacuum that had compounded my life for so very long. I began to heal remarkably quickly, and I felt as light and as free as a butterfly that was emerging from a cocoon to embrace a bright, cheerful and happy world. I ascertained that on a deeply subliminal level, I had clearly missed my twin's absence in my life. At last, the perplexing, indecipherable mystery had been brought out into the light of day, and the dark clouds had dissipated like the vapour from a steaming kettle. It was wonderful to be alive, and for the very first time in ages, I was extremely happy. My psychologist informed me that cutting is indeed a secret condition suffered by many in deep silence and used as a coping mechanism around the world, much like some people might use drugs, foods, alcohol or even cigarettes to cope with something very stressful. And that did make me feel a lot better about what I'd done. We had never been a wealthy family by any manner of means, but we've always been a devoted, close and loving one. We've often struggled to get by financially because things can get tight from time to time with so many hungry mouths to feed. This is why my mother and I accepted the job to come up to Aspen to make extra money during the winter season. We were assured by our employers that the job was rarely worthwhile as some of these affluent families do tip very generously and it was an added incentive for us over and above our pay packet. Well, that's what they told us anyway. My incredulous story that ultimately led to my Bigfoot encounter happened in 2015 when my mother and I had been recruited as a joint team to clean out two cabins together, one that was the furthest away on the resort, flanked by a heavily wooded area of exquisitely beautiful quaking aspen trees with shimmering foliage and big tooth aspens that during winter are cloaked with veils of white snow that hang from the trees like ethereal ice crystals and are rarely exquisite. We had spent the first two days in Aspen being fully trained by a member of staff on how to ensure that we turned out the cabins meticulously and that there was no dust anywhere. So began our cleaning adventure, and it most certainly was exactly that. It was also an education and an eye-opening experience to see how the other half live when money has never been an issue in their lives. In all my life, I've never seen so many designer handbags, shoes, expensive clothes and luxury perfumes and makeups. But at the end of the day, that is all they were, just things. And I soon realised that with or without money, they really were not much different to any of us. One day as my mother and I were making the bed in one of the cabins in my peripheral vision, I was certain I'd seen something standing at the window, looking in at us with a nose smudged against the pane. I looked up for a brief moment, and I saw this very large face and these big, soulful, dark, curious eyes studying us. This was the window that was situated only yards away from the densely forested area of Quaking Aspen. It happened so quickly, one minute he was there, and then he was gone. And sometimes when things happen that fast, you begin to perceive that you must have imagined things. I was almost sure that I had. Did you see that, ma'am? I asked. Did I see what? she asked. That strange face staring at us through the window. It was black and hairy. Oh, it was probably a bear, said my mother. I don't think it was a bear, I told her. It was something else. 
I remember that day with crystal clear clarity, as for over two weeks of cleaning this particular cabin, an area of the bathroom floor close to the toilet seat had been wiped down scantily, failing to conceal the tell-tale trails of bloody residue that looked ominously like the crime scene after I cut myself in secret when I was going through such a challenging, tumultuous, turbulent time in my own life. I also noticed a tight knotted plastic bag hidden in the bathroom bin. Every day for two whole weeks I had discovered it was full of tissues covered in blood. I immediately suspected that one of our guests was a secret cutter like I had been, and this was confirmed when I saw some blood-covered blades hidden in the lady's bedside table, along with lots of plasters and bandages. It was a scene that haunted me and brought back so many horrific, horrible memories of a time when I began cutting myself. I was so certain that this lady was suffering as much heartache as I had been, and I wanted more than anything in the entire world to help her. I knew that she was stinking rich, and I was exceedingly poor, but in the huge scheme of things, we weren't really much different between each other. I wrestled with my conscience: should I pretend not to have seen what I had already discerned? Would it not be like walking past someone collapsing in a supermarket and doing nothing to help them? It seemed so morally wrong to me. I had no idea what I should do. It really was a conundrum. Look, ma'am, I said, showing her the bloody blades. I think we have a secret cutter here. I wish I could help her, darling. It's none of our business. We're only here to clean, not to interfere in other people's lives. We could potentially lose our jobs if we began meddling in other people's affairs. And believe me, darling, they would not thank us for it either. No one likes their secrets being brought out into the light for everyone to see and to judge. You didn't. I knew I could never get my mother to understand the true gravity of the problem. She did not relate or even conceive the hopeless despair that I went through that time that I was cutting myself for so many years, and how tortuous it had been for me. I couldn't just sit back and do nothing to help, but I had no idea what course of action to take. So I prayed about it earnestly, asking for guidance and direction. I even asked God for a sign: should I intervene or not? Show me whether I should or shouldn't. It was as if a door had suddenly been opened for me to play my part in this unfolding drama. For later that afternoon, I was asked by one of the managers if I could stay on a little longer, as a recently vacated cabin needed cleaning for the guests that were arriving the following morning. He had chosen me and not anybody else. I know it's late in the day, he said, but the cleaner has suddenly taken ill, and I need this job done pronto. I'll do it, I said, telling my mother to go back to Snowmass, and I would return later that evening. After the cleaning job was finally completed and I was satisfied that the cabin was indeed presentable, I ambled casually towards the cabin that I'd been cleaning earlier on in the morning. I decided that the best course of action to take was to talk to the lady's husband in private. I would tell him what I had uncovered about his wife. I knew I risked losing my job for interfering in other people's business, but how could I just sit back and do nothing either? I felt that I had been guided to speak to this man, as the path had been supernaturally cleared for me after my prayer. As I approached the cabin, I determined that no one was actually there. So that was when I decided to kill some time while I waited for the people to come back by exploring the woods that flanked the cabin to see if I could get any sightings of the strange critter that I had observed earlier on in the morning, staring at me from the window. I was inquisitive about what it was and was pretty certain it hadn't been a bear. I was eager to get to the bottom of this intriguing, insidious mystery. I began hiking into the woods and was glad that I was wearing appropriate shoes, as the snow was very deep. That was when I observed these very large footprints in the snow that looked human, only infinitely larger, as the size of these feet were massive and were possibly eighteen inches long and eight inches across. I noticed that the curious footprints trailed deep into the sylvan. I hastened to say curiosity got the better of me, and I was not embroiled in thoughts for my own safety either, which was exceedingly odd. In fact, on the contrary, I didn't give the matter a moment's consideration. As I was desirous to follow these footprints to see where they ultimately led, nothing was to prepare me for what I would encounter. I stealthily followed the footprints until I observed the dark silhouette of a very large critter whose gargantuan dark brown form was pronounced against the vast, undulating expanse of glistening, crisp white snow. 
Luckily, his back was turned away from me, and so I quickly took cover behind a rocky outcrop and surreptitiously slid my tiny pair of binoculars out of my handbag to focus in on the critter. I nearly dropped them in astonishment when I realised at once that this critter was no bear. But what on earth was it? This stocky, bulky, hair-covered critter possessed overlong arms and huge human-like hands and was easily over seven foot tall and six hundred pounds. In a trice, it turned around to face my direction, although thankfully it did not discern me. That was when I realised the gravity of what I was seeing, as the humanness of this creature was nothing short of extraordinary. I could hear the involuntary loud thumping of my heart pounding violently in my chest, and even feel its intense vibration as my shaking hands kept watching the critter with a mixture of awe and total wonderment. Then it suddenly dawned upon me like a bright spotlight illuminating my thoughts. Could this be a Bigfoot, I wondered in awe? Of course it was. It couldn't be anything else. I'd always perceived that Bigfoot was a creature of fiction, but I do remember an uncle of mine telling me once that it was highly likely that creatures of fiction may have existed at one time in our reality, like unicorns or elves, and as a young child that idea had always appealed to me, whether it was true or not. As I was considering all this in my mind, my binoculars fell onto the ground with an almighty loud thud, and I was thinking, Oh no, please, don't let the creature see me! But it was too late. In seconds, the Bigfoot was standing literally five feet away from me. For a moment, I was filled with the most gut-wrenching fear that can only imagine is similar to what you might feel standing in the presence of a dangerous predator, much like a lion, tiger or elephant. For indeed, this creature was built like a rhino and demanded immediate respect. It was easily as intimidating as any of these forementioned remarkable beasts, maybe even more so. I knew at once that this critter could kill me in a heartbeat without even breaking a sweat, as he was built for speed, power and strength. Every part of his Herculean body was rippled with dense, sinewy muscle. I remember I wanted to run away so very badly, but I just couldn't. I don't even know why. I just stood there staring at the critter, feeling sick to my stomach, and I could taste the nausea rising up at the back of my throat. In that moment, I was certain I was going to die. I do not remember a time ever being this terrified by anything before in my life. In fact, my fear level was off the charts. At closer inspection of the prodigious critter, I knew he was the one that had been staring at me through the cabin window earlier on in the morning. I realised by the expression on his face that he also recognised me, and he seemed so delighted to see me, almost as if I was an old friend of his. The critter pointed towards the cabin and then to himself, and I knew he was saying, I saw you this morning through the window. He began to make a few excited whoops. Whoop! Whoop! That actually made me laugh. In that moment, my fear dissipated as fast as the steam from a cup of hot coffee. I pointed towards the cabin and then to him, and I said, Yes, that was you this morning. The expressive, unusual critter whooped again. Whoop! Whoop! It was like he was saying, I can't believe it's actually you, and you came all this way just to find me. And I suppose in a strange, curious way, I had done so. That is what I sensed he was actually saying to me with his exuberant, garrulous chatter that sounded a lot like gibberish. It was incredulous to observe how human this extraordinaire creature was close up, because his deep-set golden-brown eyes were intelligent, discerning and kind. I didn't even detect an ounce of malice or aggression towards me on his part. I noticed his leathery grey face was incredibly human-like. His dark nose was flat against his face, and his pronounced brow ridge furrowed with deep wrinkles. I could swear the critter was actually smiling at me as its long, thin lips twitched up at the edges. For a long while, the critter chattered away jubilantly, and I nodded at him as if I understood everything he was saying, although of course I didn't. I did discern that every time he was happy about something that he was telling me in his chattering language, he would make a low whooping sound. I know people talk about Bigfoots making high-pitched whoops, but these ones were very conversational and expressive, more like an explanation mark or something, something being very good or exceedingly pleasing as part of a strange language. All of a sudden we could hear the sound of human voices talking to each other coming towards the cabin. 
and that was when the critter suddenly became very self-conscious and self-aware. He became reticent and began gliding away, moving his body with such a seamless grace. He looked like he was floating on top of the snow, and one of his strides was easily equivalent to about five feet. I realised that by nature, although curious, he was also evasive, elusive and reclusive. I was sad that he had gone, but I realised that the voices were coming from the people that I was intending to visit. I could hear the young man saying to his wife, Look at the size of these gargantuan footprints, and I realised he must have noticed the Bigfoot trails in the snow. I noted he was still studying them when I approached him. He was bending down on his knees and had placed a pencil next to the footprint by way of a measuring scale. I observed he was taking some cell phone pictures of the prints and was relieved to see that his wife had in fact retreated indoors. He looked up at me in surprise when he saw me coming towards him through the quaking aspen trees and gave me a warm-hearted smile which broke the ice and increased my confidence. Big, aren't they, I said, referring to the footprints. Very odd, he agreed. Definitely not a bear. But what they are, I can't even imagine. Sir, I said, my name is Martina. I need to speak to you about something. I'm your cleaner at the cabin. Oh, hello, Martina, he said. Very nice to meet you. What can I do for you? I proceeded to tell him that I thought his wife might be a secret cutter, and I knew it was absolutely none of my business, and I didn't mean to pry or intrude, but I had personally been a cutter for many years, and getting help was the very best thing that had happened for me, and I thought he should know so that he could help his wife through her problem. The young man became enraged at my impertinence and said to me, You are right. It's none of your business. Stop poking your nose in my affairs. Your job is to clean, not to offer counselling services to my wife. Now leave us alone at once. I remember walking away, wishing that the ground would swallow me, and with all my heart that I hadn't interfered. I also wished I'd listened to my mother's wise advice. I was now certain that in the morning the man would have filed a complaint against me, and rightly so. I would receive my marching orders, which I well deserved. I also perceived my mother would be mad at me for being such a meddling, presumptuous, interfering busybody. I felt so afflicted by remorse and self-reproach, as if I'd done something treacherously wrong, and even the awe of seeing a Bigfoot was clouded and subdued by my escalating guilty conscience. You're an idiot, I told myself again and again. You don't go putting your nose into other people's affairs. What on earth have you done? How could you be so silly? Imagine my amazement when the following morning the guests had left and my mother and I were cleaning out the cabin and under the pillow was a letter addressed to me, containing over $2,000, and it read the following. Dear Martina, I'm writing to apologise you for the way I reacted when you graciously and so eloquently informed me about my wife's deep dark secret. I just didn't want to believe that what you were telling me was true, and that I hadn't discerned that this was indeed going on. I appreciate that it must have taken an enormous amount of courage on your part to tell me all of this but I'm so pleased that you actually did. My wife lost her father in a skiing accident last year, and I had absolutely no idea that her inconsolable grief was so bad that she had actually sought relief in cutting herself, something that I gather she has been doing for eight long months now. I knew nothing about this until you graciously brought it to my attention, of which I am eternally grateful to you. Please do not reproach yourself for telling me, despite the negative reception you received on my account. I confronted my wife last night about this issue, and she told me everything, and was so glad and relieved to share her issues with me. I will be ensuring that she receives the help she needs when she returns home. This is a small token of my appreciation for all your troubles on my part. Many thanks. Arthur Bordeaux. I read the letter to my mother and she looked at me in astonishment. You told him about his wife cutting herself? How could you do that? she said, looking at me in horror. I'm sorry, Mum. I know I shouldn't have told her, but I couldn't help myself. I had to interfere because I wanted to help her so badly. In that case, maybe you did the right thing, said my mother. Maybe you were meant to help her. Perhaps you were her earth angel. All this happened six long years ago, 
when a dark cutting secret ultimately led to an encounter with the hairy man himself, otherwise known as Bigfoot. So there you are. That's my story. What an extraordinary story. Thank you so much for sharing it with us, Martina. Until next time, goodbye and good night.